Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. This is Daryl. Hope you guys are having a good uh, week. Um, I was able to uh, get your uh, main assignments, 1.4s, graded for most of you that turned them in last night. Uh, I was very pleased. Most, most of you are doing really well. I, I saw some excellent papers. I, I think you guys are really good at taking complex instructions and, and uh, following them and doing what we ask. So I think it's going to be a really good group. Uh, so this week we move from looking at other people's presentations to starting to work on our own. And uh, we have uh, two really challenging assignments. I think you're going to find them a lot of fun. And uh, I want to uh, spend most of the time tonight explaining them so you, you have a really clear, uh, clear idea of what we ask for. Uh, this week the, the reading moves from uh, Resonate to uh, Slideology. We have several chapters of Slideology. Plus a few more chapters of resume that we asked you to read. And uh, one of those chapters of uh, Slideology is called The Five Theses of the Power of Presentation. It was Nancy uh, Duarte's first attempt to kind of tell us what was special about presentations, about what they can do that other things, uh, other, other forms of uh, expression can't. And um, uh, some of the things uh, she says we, we've heard of before, like the audience is the, the hero. The audience is what you need to focus in on, that you you have to make presentations specifically for particular audiences, that the presentations have the ability to be tailored, characterized, and that it's your job as the artist creating a presentation to know what will or won't work with the audience. And if you don't know, then, then you should do research to find out uh, as much as you can about what will work with the audience. Um, that presentations can be something that that is very viral. You can move people and spread ideas. That you can get to the heart of things very quickly. We've said that presentations necessarily should be short. They shouldn't be padded full of extra stuff. They should be stripped down and get directly to the heart of whatever it is that you want to say, so that they focus and clarify the mind. And in doing so, they become something that um, helps people to spread ideas very quickly because you're communicating directly from person to person. You really are um, getting to the heart of things with presentations. Presentations need to be visual and specifically the visuals help you in the understanding of what has to be uh, communicated. Most of the time we are depending on the presenter to give us the information. Uh, often that's, that's oral. Uh, you, uh, you have a live speaker standing there speaking to you, or in our case, we're going to have a recorded soundtrack. That audio is the main bit of information, but the slides are the th things that help us really understand what's being said. So uh, the slides are not just uh, uh, an afterthought. They're not uh, uh, de dress decoration. They're a, a very vital part of the communication. And so we want you to practice design, not decoration, in the making of slides. We don't want you to make pretty images that fill the screen and look nice. We want you to create images that augment what's being said and help us to understand what's going on at the moment because the slides are there to assist us in understanding what's going on. And uh, lastly, in, in uh, what she noticed is that presentations have these um, dynamics going on that create healthy relationships. If you're in a live performance, then there's a, a dynamic between the presenter and the audience. The presenter can see the effect that he or she is having on the audience, and you can uh, adjust your, uh, your, your, uh, your performance. You can, uh, if they're listless, you can put more energy into it. Uh, if it's going on too long, you can speed it up. If, if uh, they aren't understanding, you can try to find new ways of, 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 of reaching them. But if you're getting feedback from the audience on how it's going as the live performer, you have the ability to vary what you're doing. Now, we won't have that in creating uh, pre-recorded uh, presentations. So we've got to put as much into the recording of our voiceovers as we can. But there are other relationships that go on. There's a relationship between the voiceover of a presentation and the slides. 
And the dynamic that's happening there is something that you do have a lot of control on, and that's what's very important for you to focus on. We want you in creating presentations to create the narrative first. The, the story comes first. So the audio portion of what you're going to do and say in a presentation has to be the first thing that you create. But once you've done that, you're going to create slides that play in the moment and help us understand what's being said, what we're hearing as the audience. And those are the relationships that we're talking about. Uh, another bit of the reading that Nancy goes into briefly is talking about the presentation ecosystem. What is the uh, process of making a presentation? And uh, each great creative art has its own uh, similar process. Uh, we, we begun to understand all of this from classic Hollywood filmmaking. Uh, Hollywood filmmaking uh, became a, a factory of sorts. And it became very standardized in the way that it, they made motion pictures. And we all kind of understood this as a three-phase process of pre-production, production, and post-production. In the old days, before computers, before digitization and, and whatnot, all of these processes were separate. So pre-production is all the planning phase. It's where you write the script. It's where you, you cast the actors. It's where you, you, you put the money together. It's where you build the sets. You do all the things ahead of the actual filming that needs to be done because production itself is a very uh, costly and time precious uh, activity. And you want to be able to schedule that to the best of your ability. And you want to concentrate so that when you're in production, you're not doing anything else and you're not waiting around, you're not wasting other people's time. And so you do all your planning ahead of time and production and, and production is when you do the filming. And in the old days, they filmed with cameras, with, uh, uh, photographic uh, uh, film in them, and so you didn't necessarily, you weren't necessarily able to see them right away. So uh, part of the planning was just making sure that you you check the uh, uh, the dailies, and if you missed a shot, you'd have to go back and repeat it. Nowadays, we can see things instantaneously. And then the final phase is called pr uh, post production. It's once the film has been created, you get together with the editor, you get together with the audio people, you put the entire package together, and it's the assembly into the finished film. Now, um, that process continues for filmmaking today, and it has a same, the same analog for audio production, video game production, uh, and, and even uh, making presentations. What's really changed nowadays is the fact that in a digital process, instead of all these being completely separate activities, they tend to take place all in the same place, all within the computer. With everything being digital, you write the script on your computer, you, uh, uh, you network with all your, uh, your cast and crew uh, on the computer. Um, if you're building sets, you might be building virtual sets, and you do that on the computer. Uh, the filmmaking, uh, you may have separate cameras, or your cameras may be built into your computers, but being digital, they're all together, and you can see what you're doing simultaneously. So that the post-production phase actually gets... Uh, commingled with production phase because you're seeing what you're doing instantaneously. But even still, once you start working on the, the finished piece, all of that takes place in the computer. The editing, the uh, audio production, all of those things now take place on the same tool. And it, and it gets to be confused. Sometimes you don't know exactly what phase you're in if you're stretching everything out. But it is uh, very helpful as a mental discipline to think of these as separate processes, pre-production, production, and post-production, planning, creation, and assembly. And for uh, the act of creating a presentation, uh, that's very important. And the thing that most people bypass in creating presentation is all the upfront planning activities. And that's what we're focusing on this week. What are the planning phases that answer the vital questions to think about all of the elements that need to be figured out if you're really going to make a great pre uh, um, presentation. So uh, in the book, Nancy looks at this as a three-phase process, message track, a visual story track, and a delivery track. And each of these have their own components. Uh, and I'm going to take a little bit of time right now and just go through these components because they're very important to understand. They're a very important part. And lots of times people skip phases 
and uh, without realizing that it's an important uh, issue to be addressed. And if you get yourself in the habit of following these processes, you know that you will always have dealt with all the issues that need to happen because it's, uh, it's a bad thing to get near the end and realize that you've forgotten to deal with something that should have happened, taken place, or gotten nailed down in pre-planning. So uh, these are, are good things to think about in terms of setting up a work process that you go through. So in the message track, we already know what the most important thing to begin with is, and that is figuring out who the audience is. Who are you talking to? How are you going to reach them? What are the uh, things that you need to know about this audience so that you can uh, effectively communicate to them? So, you know, that almost begins at the beginning once you have your topic or you, you're beginning to work on your topic. And the next phase is called the ideation phase. Now, this may be a, a term you haven't heard before. Uh, it's a very, very, very important part of the project. And um, it is, ideation is the sister word of another word you are very familiar with, creation. And you all know that creation is the act of creating stuff. So ideation is simply the act of generating ideas. And this is a hugely important term that we don't use very much because we've had this um, shorthand for it that we use instead that has become much more popular. Everybody all knows ideation as brainstorming. Now, brainstorming is just a metaphor. Brainstorming imagines that there's some meteorological event happening in your head and that there's a storm going on, that uh, somehow you're, you're creating lightning and thunder and you're moving stuff around in the back of your head. But ideation is the idea, notion of generating ideas. And at the beginning of a project, we want to do a phase where we are just simply generating lots of ideas for this project, things that could happen, things that might be part of it, things that could uh, go on in this project. And everybody has that sort of early design phase, and everybody does it quite differently. Uh, there is no one way. But I will ask everybody to think about the fact that whatever your normal process is, to, to improve yourself as an artist, push yourself to increase that ideation or design phase a little bit longer each time. If you spend five minutes brainstorming normally, you know, try to push it to seven. See if that changes the kind of work that you do. If you normally spend 20 minutes or two days, then spend 30 minutes or three days doing this because we all tend to cut out of the brainstorming process too early and we cut up, close ourselves off to a lot of the better ideas. Um, the human mind is, is kind of a mystery to us still today. And we don't really know where all these ideas are coming from. They're connections that are made in the back of our head from information that we already know and we've stored and things that we've known or heard or thought about, but haven't really pushed to our consciousness before. And in the brainstorming process, we're just trying to, to create a mood or a tempo, uh, 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 a space in our, our thinking where we can let some of these ideas come forward. And uh, one of the ways that you help is by generating wild and crazy ideas that somehow loosens you up. And so the whole point of brainstorming is just to go on long enough that you've generated enough ideas that once you get onto the regular, um, more regimented working, that you've got a lot of material to work with. It's not to say that you won't have more ideas later on or that you didn't already start with an idea, but brainstorming is the point where you're trying to come up with enough material to fill the project that you're working on. So once you've got a lot of ideas, then you go into an editing or writing phase where you narrow them down, you try to work them in, and we're trying to turn this all into a story. We're trying to figure out how can we create a framework for this information that gives us a beginning, middle, and end, that tells us a, a logical story that goes from point A to point B that an audience wants to hear, and what is a compelling way to tell that story. And there are lots of ways to tell stories. We're going to think about that a little bit this week, too. But in 
figuring out how to get your message across. You then have all the elements that you want to um, try to include, and that helps you to create the framework as well. Uh, and then we move into the more structured writing. You, you might write in a script page. You might write in Microsoft Word or a diary. You might write on a notepad. There's no one way that everybody works, but you need to try to um, experiment around while you're here in college to find out what is the most fluid and creative way for you to work. Some people like to work on paper. Some people like to work in the computer. Some people are starting to do all their work on the phone. Uh, some people still uh, sketch things uh, or type, use a lot of text. Uh, and the phone is a, a, a kind of tool where you can make audio notes as well. So you can, you can just speak a lot of things. And we have now uh, text-to-speech tools so that you can uh, turn your, your, um, your audio notes into text notes very quickly without even necessarily having to retype them yourself. You can let uh, something like Siri or um, uh, 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 Google do that for you. Um, the second track is the visual story. It's the visual elements that are going to go along that are going to create the mood and comment on what you have to say. And again, uh, there's a pre-planning phase where you're gathering materials. Uh, there are a lot of ways that people like to gather visual materials. People create mood books in which you can gather colors and images and type and, and uh, uh, collect things together. Uh, there's a digital uh, website called Pinterest, which is really great for creating collections of images. And you can use those um, to kind of help you group ideas together. And then uh, there's storyboarding and, and uh, other kinds of uh, visual um, uh, structuring. It can help you to try to put it together. But all of this is in the pre-planning phase. You aren't necessarily knowing exactly what the slides are, but you're thinking about what kinds of visuals you are going to be appropriate for the story that you're telling. Another aspect of visual thinking is figuring out how you want to illustrate things. Uh, a quite common component of creating slides is that you're creating an analog of what's being said. And so you know what's going to be on the soundtrack or what uh, you're telling in the story that is something that you want to illustrate. But the depth or visual... Um, sophistication to which you want to apply that uh, is a choice that you make ahead of time. And certainly when we all are beginning, we just go for the, for the quickest, easiest image. You know, if you're going to have, if you're going to talk about a tree, you might just go into clip art and find a clip art of a tree and that works just fine. You put the idea across, you're talking about a tree. Someone sees a cartoon picture of a tree. Perfect. Mission accomplished. But, when you go in for clip art, when you go in for easy images, you're also saying something about who you are as an artist and who your audience is as a, um, a, a collective group. And so sometimes you want to push that a little bit higher. You want people to think a little bit higher of you. Maybe you're addressing an audience that's a little more sophisticated. Uh, you know, if I were going to make a presentation for third graders, I certainly wouldn't want to get any more sophisticated than a cartoon drawing of a tree. But once I start uh, presenting to college students or graduate students or programmers or people at the game company I want to uh, uh, impress, cartoon images might not cut it anymore. That, that will say he's stuck back in a previous age. And you want to impress people with your ideas with your thinking. You don't necessarily always use your own art. If you do use your own art, you want to show that off. You want to show that to best advantage. But even when you're choosing other images, the quality of the images that you pick says something about you. So you want to, you want to think a little bit about what are you going to use? How are you going to express yourself? And again, a lot of this is knowing your audience. Um, if you're speaking to film folks, you might want to use a lot of um, movie clips as uh, illustrations. If you're speaking to video gamers, 
You might use video game art. Uh, you've got to choose the visual medium that is the most appropriate for the audience that you're talking to. And that's part of the planning that you want to do. Another aspect of visual thinking is figuring out how to tell stories about information. Now this involves charts and graphs and infographics, but you're creating visual models for people for how to understand data or inanimate material. And if you have the ability to do that in a way that helps a lot of people understand complex things for the first time, that makes you a very valuable person and you're going to be able to get work uh, for the rest of your life using that skill. The ability to tell stories about information, to be, create models for people to understand uh, is, a, is a, a very special skill and usually this is the kind of crew that has that skill. So think about that. Think about the possibilities for that. Um, and then lastly, uh, think about graphic design. I'm not telling everybody that in order to make a presentation, you have to be a graphic designer, but I am telling everybody that by the time you're ready to make a presentation yourself, you've been um, hit with visual messages all your entire life uh, in all kinds of media, on television, in print, on the computer, uh, and that we may not be experts in graphic design, but we certainly are all very sophisticated at having read the signage and graphics that are, that are aimed at us. And you can turn that around and use that as a way to make very clean, very easily understood slides. Um, slides come up in motion. They come up for a certain period of time and they go away. And uh, um, the shorter the slides are on, the better they are. But if they're going to be on a short period of time, they cannot be confusing. They have to be very well understood slides. So if you're thinking about how do you communicate in time so that people very quickly get the message and they're not being distracted or, or taken away from the voiceover by having to decipher what they're looking at, one of the interesting things to think about is just the signage in the world and specifically the signage that you see along the highway. When we drive down the highway, we're usually going 60, 70, sometimes 80 miles an hour. And there's lots of really relevant information on the signs along the side of the road that we need to see and understand. Uh, if we don't know where to get off the highway or we don't know where something important is going to change it on us, it's going to be very impactful in the way we drive. So those signs have to be super clear. And if you think about them, they're not overly embellished. They do not have very fancy type on them. They're usually very clean. They have a solid background, often just green or yellow, very clear. And the type has enormous contrast and great amount of white space so that you can get what's being said very quickly. That's important. If uh, Your slides are going to happen in time the same way that the signs along the highway are happening. Maybe not quite that fast, but your signs, your slides should uh, ideally be on for less than 20 seconds. So you do not want to have very complex uh, photo montages that take a lot of time to unpack. You want to put your ideas together. And if you want to put a lot of images out there, it's better to do them over multiple slides than to build one complex slide that just hangs on for a minute and a half. That has a, a sense of static non-motion about it. So uh, graphic design will help us to think about what works fast, what is clean and readable, um, what are symbols that we can use that people understand. Uh, and I think we all can pick that up without necessarily having studied graphic design. We all ha have been uh, bombarded with the graphic design ourselves and we we understand what works and doesn't work. Another aspect of graphic design is just keeping things clean and separated. We don't want to uh, run type over photographs and uh, create a contrast problem. Uh, if you're running type over a photograph, it's best to put some kind of plate behind it so that the uh, uh, readability stays high. Uh, and uh, be very careful when you run type over photographs that, that 
people can still read what you have to say. Um, another aspect of visual design, visual delivery is motion design. And I know that in um, a lot of the uh, exotic PowerPoint uh, presentation programs like PowerPoint, they have very complicated transitions. But I don't really care about transitions. Transitions aren't about your content. That That's something that happens between slides, and that's Microsoft or Apple showing off their own capabilities. But uh, there is motion design in which you are controlling the intention of the viewer. And uh, uh, it's usually very simple but directed kinds of motion. Imagine that uh, there was a, there'd be a slide that comes on that has five bullet points on it. Now, we've said we don't want you to, to, to load the entire uh, presentation up with bullet points, but there might be a legitimate point in which you're talking about five different ideas that are grouped together and you want to put them to, uh, on the screen together as bullet points. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. But you might not necessarily want to bring the entire slide completely built on with all five points. Because what will happen? Uh, you bring on the slide, and the audience starts to read the first point and then read ahead. And they're not necessarily listening to you. When, in fact, you can start the slide as a blank screen and slide in point number one as you're talking about it. And as you control the timing, as you control the sync on a presentation, you can wait until you're about to talk about point two before you slide that second point in. And the advantage there is that you're keeping the audience in the moment. You're never letting them read ahead or get behind. They are seeing the information on the screen as you're talking about it. And that's the kind of sync that you want to adhere to the most. That's, that's using your slides to the best advantage. Your slides are always in sync with what you have to say, and the audience is never uh, uh, driven off a message by trying to read ahead or, or catch up. And uh, you can do that with simple bits of motion design. You can also create uh, more interesting effects by layering things up with a little bit of motion design, like just what just happened here. Uh, the third final uh, aspect of the uh, pre-production or uh, of the uh, production uh, ecology, ecology is the delivery method. You have to think about how are these presentations being delivered, and we're defining presentations really broadly. Uh, I don't want you to just get stuck in your head that the TED talk that you watched last week is the only kind of presentation. That's the classic kind of presentation. It's in a classic venue. It's actually a theater. It's, it's a classic circumstance, a presenter presenting live. But there are a wide variety of uh, uh, possibilities. And you have to think about these as the, uh, the creator because these possibilities affect the way that you create. Now, you always need to have a human element in your presentation. And that's why we, uh, for this month, have defined that everyone has to have a voiceover. Your voice is the human connection where you show up and you're part of the presentation. So you can create remote presentations that get sent out and that you're not actually present for the delivery, but you are there as a human component. And, and you have to figure out what is the human component for each presentation. Is it a live performance? Is, is it something that happens in a theater? Is it something that happens in a conference room? If it's in a conference room, uh, then what are the circumstances? Are, are, are you going to know all five or six people that are in the conference room? Are these your coworkers? You know them intimately so that you can address them at, as each part of, of the presentation you're doing pertains to what they're talking about. Uh, and if you're planning to do this around the conference room, are you just standing at the table? Or are you going to go at the front of the table and stand in front of a, uh, uh, a television monitor? Or are you, uh, are you going to have your laptop on the, on the table and everyone sort of sits around and watches that and you're maybe behind it talking? Think about the circumstances of your delivery for various elements and what is the human connection. Because in each one of these instances, uh, there is the possibility of using your own communication tools beyond just your voice. 
if you're there live in that classroom, uh, in the conference room, or on that theater in, uh, in the TED type audience uh, auditorium, you have the ability to use your hands. You have body language. You can you can look people in the eye. You have uh, eye contact. Uh, are you recording this with a, a webcam? In in that case, you have facial expression. You can look straight into the camera and be an on camera presence for the presentation. So. Even if you're not there personally, you have human elements that you're bringing into play and you have to think about how are you using these to your best advantage. And the next thing that's really important to figure out is how is the audience receiving this information? Are they, are they there live? Are they sitting in a theater and is it, uh, the slides are projecting on a screen uh, behind the stage? Are you in a classroom and you're sitting in a desk and the the slides are, are uh, being projected on a large TV or, or maybe a 10-foot screen above the chalkboard. Uh, are you in a church? And maybe there might be three or four monitors around various parts of the stage. Uh, there are different ways, different venues, and different things that people have to figure out. And if it's not live, that's even more important to figure out. Is someone going to be watching what you're doing on a computer? that's maybe 15, uh, 14, 15 inches, uh, and is basically the rough, roughly the same size as this uh, uh, device you created it on, or maybe they're gonna watch it on their phone, and you created it on your laptop, but uh, now they're gonna watch it on a phone and it's four or five inches across. Does your presentation scale down? Have you thought about what it looks like going from a laptop to a, uh, a phone? Or maybe you created on the phone and now it's going to get put on a 40-foot screen. How is it going to scale up? Have you thought about the resolution of the images that you've picked? Are they going to scale up so that they look good that, that large? So thinking about the circumstances of the delivery is an important part of your job as a creator in the pre-production phase. It's all part of what you have to figure out. And knowing that technology is going to change through the future and virtual reality is coming and augmented reality is coming and larger displays with interactive components are coming. So there are all kinds of new technology that we might end up having to design for that we haven't really even thought of yet. And you have to think about what are the elements that I need to create that preserve the possibilities for me to uh, use in some of the newer technologies that's coming along. You don't really have to become a, you know, a, a futurologist so that you absolutely know, but you can have your ear to the ground. You know now that while you're using your phone for um, uh, shooting vertical video, that uh, 4K video is becoming more and more popular and uh, even bigger. So you know that the possibility of bigger resolutions are, resolutions are happening. You know that the uh, headsets of virtual reality, the Oculus and so forth, are becoming a bigger and bigger deal. That may become one of the ways that we watch presentations. So you might need to think about what is a 360 degree space that I can present in that not only is just a 2D screen in front of someone, but it has uh, components for people to look left and right and find additional information. How would I design for that? So you keep an eye on where technology is going so that you do not get left behind when it uh, comes into play. And finally, the last aspect of the delivery is something that's going to sound funny. We traditionally call it paper. We can also call it leave behind because in a digital world, it sounds funny to call it paper. But in, uh, what would happen is in a regular presentation, if someone were at a theater or in an auditorium, delivering a presentation about a particular cause or uh, something that they wanted to sell. And you had a very involved presentation and it was very persuasive. And you got everyone excited and they were ready to join the cause. They were ready to buy your product. And the presentation ends. What happens when the presentation ends? How do you continue that conversation? That's part of what you have to plan for. Now, if in a live circumstance, you might have business cards that you'd hand out or you might have a brochure or you might have a sales uh, pamphlet that you would hand out to people, and it might be designed exactly in the same style as your presentation. But 
do not think that when you create a presentation, even if you put your name and your phone number or your, your Twitter handle or your Instagram handle or whatever on the very last screen, I guarantee you no one is ever going to pull out pencil and paper and write that down uh, on the last slide. However long you hold that last slide up, if it's got a phone number or your name or some way to contact you, no, one, no one's going to do anything about it. Uh, so you have to figure out as the, as the creator, what are you going to do to keep that conversation going? What is your lead behind? And so if your presentation is on a YouTube page, what else have you got on that page so people can contact you? Do you have a link? Do you have some kind of email uh, address there? Do you have a phone number published somewhere uh, below the, the, uh, the video so that people can continue the conversation? That's part of what you have to figure out. Uh, assume that your presentation is successful. How do you continue the conversation? That's, that's one of the things you have to figure out beforehand. Uh, you can't figure out after you let it go because you can't uh, unring a bell. So that's the presentation ecosystem. At each step along the way, you have the ability to look at what you're doing, think about it, make it better, do a self-critique, and keep uh, making the product better and uh, uh, more evolved. Now, our... Uh, our, our main assignment this week is going to involve planning for the presentation you're doing next week. So I'm going to have to tell you all about that presentation. And you're going to have to create this week a planning document. And so I want you to go through a brainstorming phase this week as you're figuring out all the elements that might go into your presentation. We're not making the presentation this week. We're planning it out. And I want you to think of these elements and I want you to jot them down. This is all notes. This is research. This is stuff that you're putting down uh, in, a, in a, a, a text document or, or some other kind of uh, digital file. And so there are rules for brainstorming. I'm going to go through those rules right now. Rule number one, postpone and withhold your judgment of ideas. Most people in brainstorming, like lots of other things, like doing a Google search, they just take the very first uh, answer that comes up and they stop and they say, well, I'm done. Uh, you're not brainstorming if you just take your first idea and, 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 and call it a day. You have to go through this process. You have to let ideas come forth. You have to look at things. You have to have bad ideas and say, well, that's not going to work. And you have to have better ideas. And you have to have wild and crazy ideas. And however you think it's going, you have to keep at it because there's always more information. There's always better ideas that can come forward. So it's a process that you've got to put yourself forward through and quitting too early is the, uh, the wrong way to go. Rule number two, encourage wild exaggerated ideas. We don't know exactly why this works, but it's part of what we call brainstorming that having crazy ideas loosens you up so that more ideas that are more fully formed that are more workable, that are, that are uh, more uh, creative, come forth. So having the wild ideas is kind of like a, a, a lubricant to getting the better ideas forward. And that's a part of the process that you need to go through when you're brainstorming. Rule number three, quantity counts at this stage, not quality. So just keep going. That's why I encourage you, whatever your process is in brainstorming now, Push it a little further. Keep at it longer because I guarantee you, you're going to end up with more ideas that are workable and you're going to become a better artist as a result of it. Now, this project you're all doing on your own. So uh, the next two ideas, uh, the next two rules are about brainstorming in teams. And when you get hired at a creative company, that's where these rules will come into play. Uh, if you work at a creative company and they have uh, problem solving points, then you're going to you're going to work as a team. And rule number four, build on ideas put forth by others. When you're in a creative team, everybody trusts each other. There's not this ownership on ideas. It's the team wins, not each individual. So when someone else puts something forward that may uh, encourage you to restate it in a different way that creates a different uh, look or vibe on it and the same way uh, you might mention something and someone else will rephrase it, reframe it, 
and build upon those ideas. You do not want to get into a, uh, uh, a mode of ownership about this. You want to be working with creative professionals who all trust each other and all want to work together for the benefit of the team. And if uh, believe me, if you've ever been in one of these creative team sessions, it is quite uh, exhilarating and liberating. And you want to be able to trust everybody in that group to have uh, the team's best interests at heart. And rule number five for the team, every idea and every person has equal worth. So for these kinds of uh, group uh, brainstorming sessions to work, you really have to have a lot of faith in your comrades. You have to have a lot of trust that everyone else there is just as creative, just as uh, 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 um, worthy of being in that room as you are. And that uh, you might even be the low man on the totem pole, but your ideas, if they're the best ideas, are going to bubble to the top. So those are the rules for brainstorming. I want you to remember them when you have to create your own uh, plan. And um, now I want to switch over and talk about the assignments. Both assignments this week are a little bit involved, and so I need to explain them as best I can. This week's discussion is really pretty cool. I think you're going to enjoy it an awful lot. And it starts with the notion of how do you get inspired and how do you spread that passion to others? Different people are inspired by different things. Some people like movies. Some people like art. Some people like books. Some people like audio. Some people like video games. But when you encounter a work of art that really, really moves you, and this is, we're talking about something external, you're not your own piece that you created yourself, but something that you come into contact with. What is the tool that you have to express your enthusiasm? How do you convince other people that this is a really great record, you have to listen to it? This is an amazing movie, you need to watch this. This video game will change your life. I need you to, I need you to drop everything and play this video game with me right now. What is the way that you transfer a passion? And I submit that we have to use our voice and we have to tell a story. And that's what I'm going to ask everybody to do in this week's discussion. This week's discussion is called emotional storytelling. And uh, uh, let me jump out here and go to the, um, uh, discussion board. Uh, does anybody have any questions at this point? Everything kind of good. I didn't ask if everybody's, uh, uh, doing all right. But uh, I assume you're hearing everything, watching everything. Somebody give me a cue in the discussion or everything's good. All right. So we're doing fine. Nobody has any questions. All right. So for this emotional uh, storytelling, I want you to come into this first page. And we have a TED Talk that we want you to watch. Now, one or two of you actually picked this, uh, this video for your choice last week, which is kind of cool. But Julian Treasure's How to Speak So That People Want to Listen is uh, an amazing piece. Julian Treasure talks to us about using our voice to communicate to other people in an authentic method so that they really feel like what we're saying to them is coming from the heart, coming uh, from a point of truth. And he talks about two different things in here. One is something he calls the HAIL method. H-A-I-L, HAIL. It stands for honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love. And what he means by that is that when you listen to other people speak, when they are telling lies, when they're talking about things they don't care about, there's a certain level of detachment in their voice. But when people have a point of emotional honesty and they're really talking to you from their heart, you can feel it in their voice. And that people have the ability to communicate on a level in which you really feel like you're hearing the truth from somebody. Now that's not to say that there aren't people who are professional liars or there aren't actors who can take us to another space or whatnot. But for the most part, most of us have trouble lying. If, if, if you were to try to tell somebody something that you knew was untrue, there'd be something about the way you tell it that, that someone who knew you would say, nah, nah, you're not, you're not, telling me the right thing here. And so there is this internal uh, authenticity to your voice. And when you want to transfer a passion to someone, you want to use that 
internal um, truth to really reach the other person. You want to do your best to communicate what you're thinking and what you're feeling. And so the other thing that he brings up in his talk is called the vocal toolbox. These are the things that are available to us as humans who communicate to use our voice in ways to really reach out and connect with other people. So what are these things? They're very simple. They're, they're just ways of speaking. You can speak really fast. What happens when you speak really fast? You sound like you're excited. If you talk really fast, you start to sound like you're very enthusiastic, that you've just caught a bug. What happens when you do the opposite? What happens when you talk very slow? Well, you become somber and serious. You might be telling us something sad. You might be telling us something that is uh, brutally honest. So slowing down kind of connotes a, a certain a sense of some, some sobriety or seriousness. You can raise your voice up and down. Raising your voice up tends to um, uh, mean like you're asking a question. Uh, lowering it down means that you're, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it communicates a feeling. Uh, you, you, you can choose to vary the space about what you're talking about. Uh, some people end up talking in a very, very regular pattern. But when you are trying to tell something that is a story, there are paragraphs, there are periods and pauses and, and uh, uh, chapter stops and so forth. So you don't necessarily always speak at the same speed at the same time. You might say go fast in a certain part and then slow down. And varying that timing is part of your communication pattern. And certainly you can use... dramatic pauses, they connote a particular kind of meaning as well. So the vocal toolbox are just simple things you can use with your voice to try to communicate. Now, I'm not expecting you guys to become experts in any of this right now. I'm just expecting you to experiment with it. But I want you to tell me a story. I want you to tell your classmates a story uh, and try to use your vocal toolbox in a way that you really communicate. And this is just the beginning of doing this. I mean, these are things you're going to play with for the rest of your life. You're going to get better and better at it. And uh, if you don't get better at it, you you, you probably will, will stop trying. But I think most of you have it within you to try some of these tools. Now, don't go overboard because that sounds kind of tricky and flashy. But just take one or two techniques and see if you can incorporate them into the way you're telling a story. So what is the story I want to tell you? Well, if you look at the instructions, the instructions are right here, and everybody needs to download the instructions. And if we look at this, it's talking about transferring a passion uh, and using the vocal toolbox and concepts of Hale, tell your audience a story centered around a piece of media that resonates with you. This can be a movie, a song, a video game, a painting, a sculpture, or a book. The options are endless. Connect with your instructor if you need assistance completing this discussion. So we at first said work of art. And the problem with using the term work of art is people thought we meant a Picasso painting. A work of art is any kind of media that affects you. And we want to, we want to define this as broadly as possible. So it can be a song. It can be... Uh, it can be a painting, but it can be a video game, it can be um, a book, it can be a book series, uh, it can be a sporting event. Um, and, then, and again, we want you to pick a discrete moment. So don't say, I love baseball, but you can say, Game 7 of the World Series just blew my mind. You know, a moment in time. And that's what you're talking about. You're talking about your encounter with a piece of media that moved you and now you're telling someone else about that encounter and you're hoping to move them with your story about it so we want you to take uh, we want you to create a two to three minute audio visual project what do we mean by this well we really only need the audio so if you're if you're not inclined to add videos that's okay 
But we want you to take uh, an event or a memory of encountering some piece of media and tell us a two to three minute story about it. And that's all we're asking. And we want you to record that and post it. So your initial post in the discussion this week is not a text post. It is an audio or a video post. So there are a number of options for the way that you can record this. And, and page three of the instructions, we have them here. But if I go back to the discussion board, you can see that I have already put in several good examples of what I'm talking about here. So uh, there are many ways that you can record your story. And the first one, the easiest, if you have a webcam on your computer, uh, is to use that webcam. So that's what I want to show you here. Uh, the first piece I'm going to show you is a YouTube video that's uh, embedded from YouTube. But um, uh, Andrew just stood in front of his computer and told us the story about watching the very first Superman movie. Now, he's, he ha uh, he's just standing in front of the computer. Uh, if you do this, you're responsible for what we see on the screen. So make sure you're, you're, you figured out what the shot looks like and you don't have extraneous stuff. You don't want, you know, your mother ironing in the background or anything like that. You want to have a clean, clear shot. But if you use your webcam, then you can use your, your, your headshot, your, your, your facial expressions, your, your hand gestures to tell the story. And, uh, I'm going to play this for you now. Let's take a look. This is Andrew talking about um, watching Superman. And I was released in 1978. I think the first time that I actually sat down and watched that movie uh, had to have been like five or six years old in that time area. Now, aside from things like great acting performances and casting, amazing technological leaps and bounds and filmmaking, having basically three separate movies in one single movie, aside from those things that I, could, that I would generally say are reasons why it's my favorite movie, the reason that I feel such an emotional connection to it um, goes back to my dad. When I was little, when I was that little, uh, my dad was in the Navy, and he was away overseas. I'm not going to play the whole thing for you right now. Uh, it's it. I've already linked this into the discussion. You can watch all these pieces in their entirety. But what I basically just wanted to show you this as an illustration. So this is what the, the webcam shot looks like. He's got his camera up or his computer up kind of high so he can just be standing. Most of you might be seated at your desk if you're doing this. Uh, but it allows him just to speak. And that's all we're asking for. Now, you'll notice that there were a lot of clips of the movie edited in here. Andrew has the ability to edit video. He, he already has that ability. So he did the, he added it because he wanted to. And you're perfectly free to do it, but I don't want anybody to feel compelled to do it. What we really want is you telling us the story directly. So if all you really know how to do is turn on your web camera and talk into it, then that's fine. You don't feel like you need to add that extra stuff. If you know how to do it and you feel comfortable doing it, uh, you know, make them as, as, as uh, interactive or, or uh, illustrative as you can. But you can do this with your computer and your webcam. And you just all you need to do is turn it on and talk to it. Make sure the uh, audio level is good. But what I'm saying here is when you turn it on, make sure that you're controlling everything in the frame and you're controlling the audio. So you don't want your World of Warcraft to be continuing on in the, on the computer in the background. You don't want your air conditioner on. You don't want your dog barking. You want to have a good, clean recording when you make this. Uh, and so when you make this and then you export it to YouTube, then you can link it back and you can play it right back in the discussion board that we have the ability to link different kinds of media in here. And that makes for a very fun discussion board. So you can see the familiar YouTube uh, interface here. It's because we've embedded this from YouTube. Uh, and you also have the ability to take your own video and put it straight into it. And I'll show you that in a second. But uh, each of these has their own ways of being linked in. And I will show you that. But the first option here is to do this. And you can do the same thing with a smartphone. And if you want to, with a smartphone, you can do vertical video. Uh, if you're, if you're t just you're going to capture your head speaking, then that might be even more relevant as a, uh, 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 a vertical video. Uh, I don't 
I don't as a rule love vertical videos, but when you're when you're doing a portrait shot, uh, it makes sense. And also with your phone, uh, one of the things you need to do is to make sure that the phone is steady. I don't want you just to hold the camera in front of your face because your hand is going to move around and that's going to create a kind of jerky motion. So if you're going to record yourself with your phone, make sure the phone is locked to uh, somewhere so that it stays steady. And a really good place to have to record with your phone for a lot of you is going to be in your car. Now notice, I do not want anybody to record while you're driving. Not while you're driving, but when you're parked and you're in your car alone, that becomes a space that you can control the audio. It has uh, a, a confined space so that the audio sound is going to be pretty good. You can probably uh, lock the phone up against the steering wheel to keep it steady. And that's a good way to record yourself. Uh, I'm sure you have a thousand ways of, of doing this, but. Uh, I'm just offering some suggestions here. So you might want to find a good place to record. And if you want to use your phone, you can do that. And uh, again, with your phone, you have the ability to both record the audio and the video and have a, a webcam type display, or you can do audio only. You can strip off the video and turn in the audio. You do not have to be on camera. Uh, if you're not comfortable being on camera, then just give us the audio only. Here's an audio only piece where um, James is going to tell us about a Bruce Springsteen song that uh, had a lot of meaning to him. And everybody has uh, their own way of telling a story. So I want to play this for a little bit just because it, uh, he doesn't get to the song right away. Let me play this for a second. I remember getting to work a little late that day. I don't remember why I was late. Maybe I had an errand to take care of on the way to work or I was just running behind. My office was on the top floor of a six story building. So I took the elevator up and walked off onto a floor which should have been loud and bustling on a Tuesday morning at nine o'clock. The first thing I noticed though, was that it was eerily quiet and just about everyone was gathered over in the corner, staring up at TV monitors that usually showed business news and stock quotes on repeat. I saw one of my friends towards the back of the crowd and I asked him what was going on. I hadn't listened to the radio on the way to work, and I hadn't seen the TV that morning at all. He said to me, two planes crashed into the World Trade Center this morning, not looking away from the TV monitor, which I just noticed showed two familiar buildings with black smoke pouring out of them. Now, again, I'll let you listen to the entire piece on your own, but he starts off with a memory, his memory of what happened on 9-11. 9-11, I know a lot of you guys are kind of young for that, but 9-11 uh, is one of those points in time where everybody can tell you exactly what they were doing when they heard the, the, this horrific news. And so it becomes one of those flashpoints. And the song that uh, James is going to talk about is a Bruce Springsteen song about firemen who are uh, working to save lives in the tower and get killed. And he has this deja vu moment when he first hears the Bruce Springsteen song, it projects him back in time to that original moment uh, that he lived through. And so I'm putting this out there to tell you that there are a thousand different ways to tell a story. There's no right way or wrong way. Uh, you, can, you can just come in right at the beginning and say, the media I chose is blah, blah, blah. But you may want to set it up differently. There are lots of ways to tell stories. And sometimes you want to set up a premise before you bring in the uh, contrast that you're going to put forward with it. So I encourage you to listen to this. And then finally, uh, this is a more traditional presentation type tool. There's a uh, uh, an online tool that we're going to recommend to you all. It's all linked in the discussion board called Adobe Spark. Uh, that uh, Adobe, uh, the company that makes Photoshop and, and Premiere and Illustrator and all that, uh, has a website that helps you to make presentations and uh, uh, Adobe Spark allows you to make short videos in which you can record your voice and add video and or pictures to it very quickly and and very quickly make a really interesting presentation so this is using video spark, this is using Adobe Spark you can see what kind of stuff Adobe Spark tells and this is a story by Danielle and again she needs to set it up a little bit before she gets to 
her favorite piece of media. So I'm going to let you tell, uh, I'm going to play this to where she introduces it so you can see how different people set up telling their story. I think we all can agree that middle school is pretty awkward. It's filled with awkward preteens and their awkward bodies navigating their awkward social cliques. But despite all of that awkwardness, it's in these fragile middle school years that children really begin to piece together who they are and what they care about. It's in middle school where self-esteem seems to be teetering on a tightrope, waiting for a strong gust of wind to push it to one side or the other. And this issue of self-esteem was no different for me. It was in middle school that I realized that I did not fit in with the other girls in my class. I was all about basketball while they were all about nail polish. I hated skirts, but they were all into skirts. The effort that it takes to put on makeup depresses me, but the time crunch never seemed to bother the other girls in my grade. I knew that the things that my peers were turning to was not authentic to me, but I still felt the pressure to conform. I was a tomboy, and in many ways I still am. And in middle school, that can be difficult to grapple with. I didn't fit into the socially constructed definition of a girl. I never got the guy. I never dressed up. I hate wearing heels. But one thing I did know was that I was in love with the game of basketball. It was in the seventh grade when I first saw what would become my all-time favorite movie, Love and Basketball. So again, she needs to set up who she is before she can tell you about her favorite movie, Love and Basketball. And this is a good example of what the, the kind of uh, um, uh, presentation you can build very quickly with Adobe Spark. And again, Adobe Spark gives you back an MPEG-4 video. So you can take that video and you can load it directly. So you can see that this video is playing in uh, the, the, a, a different interface than YouTube, because YouTube is linked from the website, and this is loaded directly to our uh, file. If we come up here and look, you see that there are a number of tools on the back end uh, at, the, at the top here in which you can embed video from different places. So if you have something from SoundCloud or, or um, YouTube or different places, you can embed media here. Uh, you can upload video MPEG-4s, and again, it has to be an MPEG-4. So if you create an AVI file or an MPEG, uh, uh, some, some other kind of video, it uh, you can link it in here, but you cannot have it play in line. It has to be an MPEG-4 in order for it to play in line. And then if you have an audio file, if you make it an MP3 file, it will play in line like it did here. If you have a different kind of audio file, lots of, lots of smartphones will record audio for you and then they'll, they'll, they'll give you a different kind of audio file. You can just use the drag and drop function to add the audio and we can still play it and hear it, but it won't play in line like that. But I'm going to be around all week and I will help people get things loaded up. So don't worry so much about how to make things play in line. If you get your file created and uploaded, uh, I will make sure that it plays in line if that's possible. And then uh, lastly, I, I, I thought I'd participate as well. So I put in a, 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 an audio file about my favorite movie, uh, The Quiet Man. And instead of uh, a picture of me, I put a picture of the um, uh, a movie poster just to give you a sense of the way the uh, – uh, what the movie was about and so forth. Um, so um, – one of the things we want to do is give you plenty of time. It says here that it, we want you to try to get it up by Wednesday, like you did last week. And so we're going to leave that in here. But anybody that needs more time, I'm going to make sure that uh, the, uh, the, the system doesn't penalize anybody who turns it in late. So if you need till Thursday to get this up, that'll be fine. Uh, but I do want you to try to get your, your uh, audiovisual post up by midweek so people have the ability to comment on it. Uh, that's going to be a really fun part of the description. So if everyone gets their initial post up, you first you have to pick the piece of media that is important to you, and you have to figure out the story you want to tell it, tell it, and then you have to figure out how are you going to how are you going to turn it into something. So are you going to use audio, or are you going to use your webcam, you can use your phone, or are you going to use Adobe Spark? And again, I highly recommend Adobe Spark to everybody. So if it sounds interesting to you, I think you should check it out. Um, and then, uh, when you post your story up and then come back, there are two ways that you can respond to your classmates. 
One is that you can talk to them about how well they used their voice. So you could talk to them about the vocal toolbox. Talk about how they, they phrase things, how they use uh, how they told their story and how they sounded, whether they, they you know, felt authentic or, or uh, you know, you, you, and so on and so forth. So we want to give each other pointers. We just want to make each other better. Uh, and you don't want to be cruel to anybody. If, if someone has, uh, you know, a, a, a way of speaking that's in, endemic to them or they have a heavy accent, we're not going to call those things out. People have their own natural voice, and I want everyone to use your natural voice. And I don't want anybody to feel bad about it. You want to speak in the way that you truly are so that we understand and hear the real you. The other way that you can um, uh, comment is on their choice of media. So if someone else does Final Fantasy VII and you love that video game as well, then you have the ability to come back and comment with them on the choice of media that they chose as well. So uh, you can bond with people over their uh, uh, media choices, or you can talk to people about how well they use their voice. And each one of those are relevant, and I think they, they'll make very interesting and involved discussions. And I think this week's discussion will be really fun. And uh, I know it's kind of intimidating, but I, I can also guarantee you that the first people who post get lots of feedback and the people usually really love that. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're motivated to get going, I can tell guarantee you that the first couple of posts that are up do tend to get the most set most comments. Uh, but you, you want to try to get your post up as soon as possible. Uh, if you wait till Sunday, nobody else is going to have a chance to comment on it. But, uh, if it takes you that long, do try to get it done. I think it's a valuable exercise to go through. I think you're going to learn a whole lot, and I think you're going to be in a much better position to make your own presentation next week if you engage in this activity. So uh, this is a fun thing. Uh, think it through, and don't don't stress it too much. Um, and look, we're only looking for two or three minutes. Uh, and somebody says, no voice modulators. No, I want to hear your real voice. Uh, I know you. a lot of you guys might be uh, um, audio engineers, and you have the ability to uh, you know, auto-tune the heck out of everything. I want to hear your real voice, and so do we. This is this is not uh, music. This is person-to-person -person communication, and so uh, you do not want to put uh, machines in the way of that. Um, and so I want to get to the main project, planning a presentation. The assignment this week is to create the plan for your presentation that we're going to do for the rest of the month. So first you have to go to the instructions again. The instructions are right here. I want you to download them and get to them. And while the instructions don't talk about it a whole lot, the actual topic of your presentation is right here. Your plan to pitch yourself to a future employer should address all the following. So what does that mean, future employer? Okay. I want you to imagine that you've graduated full sale, that whatever you came here to study, you've acquired all that knowledge, that you've taken all these programs, that you've done all these uh, portfolio work. Maybe you've even worked a little in the, the private sector afterwards. But you now have all of the skills that you've been working to acquire to go for your dream job. So the presentation that I want everyone to create next week is a three to four minute presentation presenting yourself and your skills and your brand to your dream employer to get your dream job. So think about the job that you always wanted to do. If you always wanted to work for Apple, you always wanted to work for Pixar, you wanted to work for Blizzard, uh, maybe some small indie record company, whoever it is that you really have been working all your life uh, to, to join their team. This is your chance to sell yourself. So we're imagining ourselves into the future. This is not the you of right now. This is the you of three or four years from now after you've graduated. And so um, you're going to create a presentation in which you're speaking directly to those folks that can make that happen. So the plan needs to identify the following objects because each of you are going to have a different dream employer and the dream employer 
is your audience. That's who you're talking to. You're not talking to me. You're not talking to your classmates. You're talking directly to the person that can give you the job of a lifetime, the one that you really want to do. And who is that? Well, it's going to depend on where you want to work. Um, you know, if you want to work at Pixar, then you're speaking to the folks at Pixar. And you've got to let them know that you understand their company culture and you have to understand, you know, what they're all about. If you want to work for Netflix, then, you know, it's the person at Netflix that can say yay or nay to your project. So part of the plan needs to identify your target audience, meaning tell me who is your dream employer and tell me what you know about them. You might need to do some research. It's not enough to say I want to work there. You have to say, I understand who they are. I understand what their history is. I understand you know, uh, what I'm going to need to appeal to them. Remember, we have to know our audience when we're going to make a presentation. Our audience has to be the hero. So we have to know enough in order to connect to them. Now, the information that you're researching for this plan is not any information that's going to go in the final presentation. You don't need to tell the, your dream audience who they are. They already know that. But you need to tell them that you understand who that what their culture is. If you want to work at Blizzard, you have to let them know that you understand their titles, that you understand their audience, that you understand the company culture. So I need to know that you understand that. So tell me what you know about your target audience. This is all text information. This is all a text document that you're creating. What is your big idea or we're, we're talking about selling your brand. That means your skill that you have to offer is your brand. You're going to offer yourself up as a, uh, a 3D modeler, as a, a, a video game programmer, as an audio engineer, as creative writer. Whatever it is that you've decided to be and where you want to work, you're going to present those skills to your dream employer. So tell me what is your big idea. Tell me what is your brand. What is the skill and uh, mindset that you bring that makes you unique and, and, and uh, someone to be hired. And very importantly, you're going to tell us the story of who you are. You're going you're gonna to tell us a story, a beginning, middle, and end. And so I need the elements of the beginning, middle, and end. The beginning, what is? How did you get started? What did you? I started playing video games at the age of five, or you know, I started playing piano when I was four years old. Whatever it is that's going to lay out the story of who you are, and what are the successes you had, what is the history you had, and tell us your true history. Uh, I went into the army, you know, I, 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 um, whatever it is that made you you, the experiences that you had, and again, this is tailored to your dream audience. So you may have had a wild and varied uh, life, but how much of it is relevant to your dream audience? You know, uh, that time you, you went on a road trip with your aunt may be hilarious, but if it's not important to being hired as a, a 3D animator, maybe that doesn't go in there. So you want to think about what are the elements of your life that are made you into who you are, that gave you your influences, it gave you your artistic vision. It gave you your skills. The middle is how you got trained. So here specifically, I want you to start talking about how did you get your skills. And full sales should factor into this. But full sales should not, ne not necessarily be the only thing here. Maybe you were in the Army, and that's what taught you discipline and management skills and, 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 and uh, how to become a leader. And those are the skills that are going to be uh, helping you get hired. But I certainly do want you to talk about what you learned at Full Sail. And you're going to talk about it in the past because you're projecting this piece into the future. You will have graduated from Full Sail. So I want you to talk about some things that you learned while you were at Full Sail. And that means that if you haven't looked at your curriculum, then you need to do that. You need to do some research this week to find out what are the classes that you're going to be taking in the next 20, 30 months? And I don't want you just to name check 30 classes. Uh, that's a pretty boring presentation. But I want you to pick one or two classes and talk about them and say what you learned from them. I had a lighting class, and, and, and that taught me all about how to, how to uh, 
set the camera and, and, and create a mood. And I had a world building class and that, that allowed me to, to figure out that I was really someone who makes interesting landscapes and so forth. So look at the classes you're going to take and figure out the ones that you think will be most influential in making you into the person you want to become and be able to talk about what you learned from them. And remember, you're going to show off portfolio work. You're going to talk about projects that you worked while you were at school. You're going to, if you were uh, studying video gaming, then you made a game with a group of people and tell us what that game was like and, 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 and how it worked and maybe what your role in it was. And you're going to invent all this. This is, this is all projection. But I want you to talk knowledgeably about this because visualizing your future is an important step in making it happen. So I want you to think about all the training that you will have done to make you into the, the superstar that these companies really want to hire. And finally, the end, the call to action. I want you to stand there, talk directly to that employer and say, I share your values. I've done all this work. I'm really creative. I want to join your team. I really feel like we can do great things together. I want you to make that sale. I want you to talk directly to them. So again, that's what I want in the presentation. What I want in the plan are the ideas. This is where you're brainstorming. You're telling me lots of things that might go in here. Maybe more stuff than actually could fit in here. Maybe your plan should be full of stuff that maybe you're even going to throw out because you've got more than, than you need. But uh, that's a problem that very few people suffer from. Most people don't put enough in their plan and they still have to, to, to figure out what they have to say. But I really want you to deal with all of these items. I want you to identify your target audience, talk about what is your idea or your brand, and the flow of ideas is the beginning, middle, and end. What are you going to say? What are you going to tell us about the story of you? Finally, what is the star moment that you might use? What is some way that you're going to show off what you have to do? Are you going to show uh, uh, footage of a game that you created? Are you going to play a song that you, you wrote? Uh, are you going to uh, show a clip from a movie that you made? And again, you haven't done this stuff yet. So you have the ability, you, you're, you're, you're able to cheat, take this media from the internet and say that it's yours. And as long as you're crediting the source, we can do this imagining. It's a, a, a way of letting people know what kind of work you're going to do. But I want you to talk knowledgeably about the product, projects, and portfolio work that you did that makes you a valuable person for your dream audience to choose. So this is a, a, a Word doc, pretty much. And again, in the same way last week, I was very happy to show examples of uh, what I wanted in the uh, uh, 1.4. I'm happy to show examples of what we're talking about here. Now, this is a, a Word doc. Again, someone's mentioning the target audience. He wants to work for Bethesda software. His big idea is, is who he is. Here's the beginning. He's talking about a young age and his experiences. He's added some visuals. You don't have to add visuals, but this is always good. Again, uh, you want to be able to collect your sources. That's part of the pre-production aspect. The middle, this is what he did in training. And his call to action. So he's got all the elements here. These are all done in, in a kind of uh, outline bullet point fashion. So there are different ways to do this. This person wants to work for Netflix. So he's got target audience, true message, future self, beginning, middle, and end. And he put this all in paragraph form. He's got all of his ideas here, and he's, he's put them together. Uh, this is the way he wants to express himself. So you all have the ability to choose what you want, the way you want to, to say what you're going to put. Most of you will want to choose this outline, bullet point kind of fashion. It allows you to define the audience, the, the beginning, middle, and end, and you can put as many points in as you need, and they can vary themselves. But as long as you've got all the elements that I'm asking for in the plan, uh, an outline works really well. Some people like to go out of their way and create uh, proof of the pudding. This person wants to be a graphic designer for Disney, so she gave me all the information she needed, but she put it in a form that was uh, proof of her skill. So she's giving me uh, a, a piece that lets her to show off her creativity 
a little bit. The more you can use your own work in this presentation, the better off you're going to feel about yourself. Uh, so there are plenty of ways to do this. Uh, mind maps, these are visual outlines. And sometimes people feel more expressive working this way. So this is a person who wants to work for Blizzard. He's telling me his true message. He's talking about his true audience, uh, his target audience. Here you have the beginning, middle, and end. So all the same elements take place, but with a mind map, you can visually map out your points a little bit differently. Some people feel more expressive about that. If you're interested, we, we're, I'm going to post an announcement about mind mapping software that you can use. <clears throat> uh, this guy just put Post-its on a wall. And uh, he gave me everything I want. I have my audience and the uh, beginning, middle, and end, his true message, and so on and so forth. So you want to work in a way that's fluid. If you want to sketch in your notebook, that's fine. But if you're going to handwrite something, I have to be able to read it. If you don't think I can read it, then absolutely I can't read it. You need to type it. But if, you're, if your notes are legible, then you can scan them and send them to me. That's all right. Uh, and if you're going to do something like this, then it has to be not just readable type, but a good photograph. A lot of people see this and try to do it themselves, and they give me a dark photograph that I can't see anything. That's no good. So if you're going to go this method, you need to know what you're doing. And, and if you're not sure, then fall back on using the outline format because this is easy to use, and it's easy to put your, your target points in here, target audience, uh, beginning, middle, and end, and all of those true message things, uh, you can't miss it. So anybody who wants some of these sample uh, items, just send me a message, and I will uh, uh, be happy to provide those to you. But you have all week, and I want you to take all week. Uh, don't give me the plan early. Make sure you wait till Sunday so you're thinking about it, you're brainstorming, you're having more ideas, you're adding more stuff to it. Uh, even if you get it started early and you create the plan tomorrow keep it around and just keep thinking about it and keep adding little points to it as well so um that's pretty much where we're at do i i know i threw a lot of stuff out there do you have any questions So remember, I recorded everything. So if there's something you need to come back and take a look at, the recording is going to be up all week. You can come back and take a look. You can ask me questions and so on and so forth. As you start to post in the discussion board, and if you want help getting your, your uh, media embedded, uh, I'll be around to do that. If you need help getting uh, any kind of technical help, getting, getting your audio recorded or converted to a different file or anything like that, I'm good at that as well. So... I just want to help make sure you all get your uh, your stories out. Uh, this is a really fun week. You're doing two really fun assignments, and uh, I want you to spend as much time making them as you can. Don't race through this stuff. Make sure you do it and you feel good about it because uh, everyone else is going to see what you do, and it's going to be uh, a, a great thing to share. So have fun being creative, these guys. And, again, uh, Adobe Spark. Um, the link is actually in the instructions. So uh, if we come here to, to uh, uh, the last page, you can see that there's a link right there, and that takes you to Adobe Spark. Uh, with Adobe Spark, it's a website. You need to log in and give them your name and create a space. And the reason for that, they're not charging you any money, but you're storing your materials on their website. So they need to be able to separate them all. So just uh, log in. Uh, do that login, and then you can create materials. And when you want to get your stuff out, you can download it. You can you can uh, uh, you, you can link it to uh, the playback on the Adobe site, but you can also download it as an MPEG four, and that allows you to uh, embed it into the uh, discussion board, like what we saw here. So uh, again, uh, the Love and Basketball is an example of uh, Adobe Story all. embedded. So you can see that it's a really nice looking uh, uh, image and uh, it's available there. Any more questions? If not, I'm going to let you guys go. And again, I'm available all week. So anytime you uh, run into a snag, get a hold of me and I'll, I'll, I'll see you through it.
Good luck, everybody. Have a great time.